Hi all, uh, welcome to the second session of uh, assignment two. So today I'm going to uh, show you the full solution for this assignment. And today I'm planning to go a bit fast uh, because uh, in the last class, I've already discussed the relevant techniques which are needed to solve this assignment. However, still, um, if you get confused at some point of time, please stop me and ask questions, okay? So, and after this, uh, uh, after I finish showing us the solutions, uh, we can also uh, see if somebody else has, uh, uh, you know, has completed this assignment and if they want to share their solution, they can. And after that, we'll take the questions. Okay, so let's directly dive into this uh, uh, assignment. So first question is that, uh, Again, you have given a multi-column table, which is SFR underscore non-star splits. So it contains uh, the star formation rate and stellar masses for about like 300,000 galaxies. And then you have been asked to do a bunch of things. Okay. So here I have highlighted the main things that are needed to do. So the first thing is that you need to make a contour plot in this parameter space. And uh, also you need to uh, compute the specific star formation rate for each galaxy, add this uh, quantity as a column to this table, and also create a contour plot. Uh, now the y-axis uh, being replaced by log uh, SSFR, which is specific star formation rate. And after that, you just need to select galaxies from three different bins in this, sorry, from three different regions in this parameter space. And you, you need to plot their fraction as function of uh, stellar mass. So this is what we are going to do. Okay, so let us directly uh, go to the solution. Okay, so uh, as a first step, we need to read the table and define the columns, which we do in this cell. Uh, this is the standard procedure. We had uh, shown you uh, this thing in the previous class as well. And um, then in order to make the uh, contours, We'll be using plt.contour function. Okay. So this requires uh, uh, apart from x and y array, it also needs some data on the z axis. And for that z axis, we'll use the counts from the 2D histogram of uh, mass and the star formation rate, which we do in this line. Okay. So we define a, a histogram, a 2D histogram from uh, in the taking log n and log SFR. We save the counts. And also, um, there are bin edges. Bin edges are then used to define the bin centers in these two lines along each x and y direction. We create a mesh grid next, and then um, go on plugging all these values in plt.contour function. So when you do this, uh, you get something like this. So here you can see the distribution of galaxies is bimodal. Uh, one peak occurs at towards uh, higher star formation rates, another peak occurs at lower star formation rates. Okay. Next step is to compute the specific star formation rate for all the galaxies, which is very simple. All you need to do is that you just uh, subtract um, log m from the log SFR, right? Because um, remember, SFR, sorry, the definition of a specific star formation rate is star formation rate divided by mass, but when we take the log, it's just a difference. So this is one line thing and it computes it. Once you do this, again, you repeat the same uh, steps here, which, uh, which are like in, in the previous cell, but now um, instead of binning in log M and log SFR, you need to bin in log M and log SSFR. This is done here. Again, as previous, we define the bin centers, create a mesh grid, and plot the this contour plot, which is, has been asked. So here you can see uh, in the previous plot, um, as the stellar mass was increasing, the star formation rate was increasing. But here you see it's kind of some kind of constant and then drops. Okay, I've also plotted uh, two lines which kind of defines the green valley region that I have talked about. And if you notice here, you can uh, see why this is called valley because it lies between two peaks. So traditionally that's the definition of valley. Okay. 
right so as a next problem uh, we are required to pick galaxies residing in different regions right so from the star forming region in the top uh, uh, portion of this plot in the valley and the below valley which is the passive galaxy uh, uh, area okay so i use np dot where to define this uh, different regions in the parameter space de uh, defined by log ssfr and log m okay and in order to get the number of galaxies in uh, each category we just need to take uh, the length of um, each array right so remember when you define a column it becomes a numpy array so if you just uh, try to find the length of the uh, column it will just give you how many objects are there right in that array so what you need to do uh, these conditions which have been defined using np dot where you apply to any column which is present in our table okay for example if i want to get the total number of galaxy i just need to take the length of uh, let's say log m array because now it contains all the galaxies suppose i want to uh, get the number of star forming galaxies i'll just apply this conditional sf which has been defined here and take the length similarly for green valley and passive sequence but this can be done in um, uh, you can like apply to any um, column so it will give you the answer so i've run this cell and now the numbers are here in front of you okay very simple fine and uh, next step was uh, you just uh, you were required to pick galaxies which are uh, star forming and uh, then we were required to fit a, a straight line and compute the scatter around it and also find the outliers from this uh, so called best fit relation okay so as a first step we pick up only star formation star forming galaxies so this sf has been defined previously okay so we are just uh, applying it here to um, select the stellar mass and star formation rates for all the star forming galaxies and then we just fit a straight line using start start link replace so what it does it just you need to supply it x r and y r and it will fit a straight line it will give you intercept and give you a slope and then we'll display it uh, we will make a scatter plot of uh, stellar mass and sfr for only star forming galaxies and then we will over plot this line which is use which is done here uh, using uh, plt dot plot if you want to see it it looks like following so the slope uh, sorry the intercept and the slope is here and so this is our fitted line okay now to find the best uh, uh, to find the scatter around this best fit relation, uh, we need to find the residual SFR. So I'm just defining the residual here, which is um, SFR minus this model that you have of galaxies. Okay, the best fit so called star formation relation. And once you get this, uh, you can just um, uh, also obtain the one sigma standard deviation using np dot um, std. And once you've got it, you can again define your outliers using this conditional, where this absolute of uh, residue is greater than three sigma. So this was defined, like find the galaxies which deviate away from this relation. Okay. So this apps is just a mod of res because it will be both positive and negative. Hence we have done it. And then again, similarly, we can show it in this plot so we are again creating the same scatter plot which was there in the previous cell but now we are also showing the outliers and to show the outliers we have defined this uh, um, using uh, np dot where and we are just applying it into this um, columns of star forming galaxies and so here we show it if i run this cell so yeah so you can just see these are the three outliers okay the last one was very easy. You have computed the log SFR, you just need to add it back into the table. Okay. And just save it in some format. I have chosen fit, fits, and I have also given it in some proper uh, appropriate name. Okay. So adding column can be done using add dot column. So T was table, we just add a column which will contain all the data which is uh, there in this array. Okay. And uh, the 
the name of that column will be this and then we just write it in fit format and save it which i have done it just saves it okay so now whether we have done it correctly or not can be seen if we display the table just run this and so here you can see another column of log ssf for has been added which we want okay so question one is done so question two was also very similar again it's question which requires you to manipulate table pritesh do you want to just interrupt and take some questions because i just to make sure everybody understood the, the solution of question one and there are a few couple of questions in the chat already okay so uh, they can unmute and ask me Yeah, maybe I can read out the chat questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, so there is one uh, which says, could you please explain the percentage matplotlib inline? Okay. So percentage matplotlib uh, inline, what it does, since you're using this in Jupyter, and suppose uh, you don't take that, uh, you don't put this, then what happens is that whenever you, so whenever you plot something, it will pop out as a separate window. Uh, which is not included in this. When you uh, put this matplotlib dot inline, it creates plots just below the cells. So it's for displaying purpose. Yeah. No, it may be, maybe my configuration file is different, but I don't have to do that. Just, just try removing it. Okay. There is another question, which is uh, for Green Valley galaxies, why are we using ampersand inside the np dot where? instead of and keyword that we usually use in Python conditionals? Uh, you can choose to like, so uh, this and this, I think both will work. It's just a matter of style, I guess. Yeah. No, there is there is a question of a logical and and uh, so something like that. Let me, I'll, I'll just check this question. I'll, 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 I'll answer this question a little later. Okay. I'll just look it up. Somebody is asking, uh, could you please explain XH X center in the histogram plot? I think people didn't understand that, how you computed X center. Okay, uh, X center, fine. So let me do one thing. Maybe I'll show you. Let's take three bins or maybe let's take two bins. I think this I had shown uh, last time, but let's do it again. What I'll do, I'll just split the cell here. Um, okay. So what we are going to do now is so let's run this once. So let us try to see what this does, right? So uh, again, since there are two bins, we have three edges, which will define the uh, bins, right? So if you print the two uh, this, uh, X edges, you are getting these three values in array. Okay, but what you actually need, need is that, so first win is from 7.25 to uh, 9.67, right? So you need a value in between. Why is that? I had explained it in uh, last class, uh, because uh, if you just make the mesh grids using edges and edges, right? Its dimension will be different from the counts of the histogram. So uh, we just need to get the centers. And in order to get the centers, this is a clever thing to do. So either you can use for loop and you know find the centers because you just need to find the mean of these two things. Okay. So, but in order, uh, in order to avoid the for loop, you can just do it in a very clever way. You can just try to see what it does. So if I just print this, uh, sorry. Uh, it will give you all the X edges except the last one. Okay. Now, similarly, if you um, do the other one, it will give you all the X, X edges except the first one. Right? 
So now suppose you just want to take the mean of these two things between seven and nine, you just need to add these two arrays, right? So this will get added and if you divide it by two, then you will get the bin center. Is that clear? Hello. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's clear. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Before you proceed to the next question, I just checked uh, this Matplotlib uh, inline business. And mm. actually, it's it's a very uh, Jupyter notebook and IPython shell dependent. Mm. So apparently for recent, uh, if you're using a recent uh, IPython and uh, kernel, uh, then it's no longer required. So one can just skip it. Okay. Okay, so let's proceed. Okay, this, I think because the bin size is different, now we are getting this. I'll make this, the plots are here. And then that's there. Okay, I think we can move into the second one. I don't think there is any dependency from the previous cell, but I'll just run it anyway. Just for the sake of completion. Okay, good. So in this question, like I said, um, first thing you have to do is that you need to cross match these two tables. The first table being which you have just uh, computed, right? Or which you have just created by adding that uh, specific star formation rate information. And the second table is given, which is like morph.fits. So it contains the uh, information about morphologies of galaxies using some uh, t-type index, right? And using this value of t-type index, you can divide the galaxy sample into two categories, the early types and the late types. And once you have that uh, early and late types, galaxies, you just need to plot their fraction as function of stellar mass. And then again, you need to select only um, one kind of galaxies uh, from that uh, SFR defined uh, uh, category. For example, you just need to select the soft form galaxies only and again, plot the fraction of early type galaxies which are star forming, star forming as a function of stellar mass. So this is the question. Okay, so again, uh, the first thing we need to do is that we just need to read the first two tables that we have. Okay, the first one is SFR mass underscore SSFR fits. This is the one that we have created in the previous problem. And the second one is the morph.fits, uh, the table associated with this specific problem. Okay, second step is that uh, we need to use the sky chords uh, to uh, join the aridic of these two. Tables. Okay, so for that we need to create this sky coordinate objects. So what it does is that you uh, give it a. So first it will take either you can give it one number or here you can also uh, supply the array. So what it does is that first it takes the array and the deck column of the first table and it will create a sky card object instance. And um, then similarly for the second table you do it right. And then what you can do first create a new table object by selecting relevant columns in your table which you want to keep, right? So since RADIC is already, uh, the information of RADIC is already contained in this SC1 and SC2 sky coordinate tables, sorry, columns, we don't need to um, um, keep the original RADIC columns, so say. If you want, you can keep it, but what I have done is that I have taken the individual columns which are relevant, and have created a table object, given them a name. So the, um, the sky coordinate is named as SC. Similarly, for the table two, I do the same thing. I just keep the t-type and the sky coordinate two, and I have named it SC. Once you have, you can just use table dot, dot join function. Uh, the join type is inner because we just want the intersection of these two tables and so unique rows, okay. And uh, here you also need to specify this join function argument where you say that match only these two tables with respect to the column SC, 
which is like join, join sky chord. And here you can supply your uh, constraint or right, rather matching radius, which is uh, one arc second. Okay. So this will select all the galaxies uh, which are matched within one arc second from one another. Okay. So uh, once you do this, this will create this matched table. Uh, the, and then you can display this um, joint table and see what happens, how many objects we get. Okay. So the cross match of these two tables have resulted in 12,380 galaxies. Here you can say, uh, here you can see that it adds some ID. So this um, table dot join it does. And then all the columns uh, which were there in the previous tables, now they are there. So for each galaxy, uh, now not only you have information on uh, stellar mass and star formation rate, but you also have information of detail. And then now this has become your new table and then you have to do all the analysis on this only. Okay. So uh, the first question was that um, um, find the fraction of early and late type analysis in this uh, table. So again, it's very easy. As previously, I'm defining the columns. Sorry, I'm, I'm defining a few uh, variables uh, which will contain the data from each column. So this is done here. And then again, I'll uh, use np.where to um, define the early and late type analysis. Okay. So once you do it, then the early type fraction can be just computed by uh, finding the length of uh, early type analysis only of some column. And then if you divide by the total number of analysis, it will be the length of the one whole column of this cross match table. Okay. And similarly for the late type fraction. So this can be obtained like this. So we can see there are like point Four five is the fraction of the type, and the point five four is the point point five four eight is like the late type fraction. So this is done. Okay. Now in the subsequent questions, uh, you have been asked to plot the fraction of galaxies as function of stellar mass for this early and late type, and um, so that will require you to bin the stellar mass axis into various bins. And each bin, you find how many of the galaxies are early type and how many galaxies are late type. Okay. And then you can divide by the uh, number of galaxies which are late type in that bin um, by the total number of galaxies in that bin. And hence, you will get a fraction associated with one stellar mass bin. And then you need to do this in like all the, all the bins and you just plot it. Okay, so clearly this will require you to bin the, your uh, uh, log n axis. And um, not only this question, but other parts also require the same thing. So what I'm going to do is that I am going to create the bins only once, and then I'll just use same bins for all uh, subsequent questions as well. Okay, so what I do is that first I find the minimum and the maximum extent of log m. And um, then using NP lint space, I just chop them into some uh, 11 pieces. Okay. So 11 pieces means then using 11 numbers, you can define 10 bins, which will be defining. And uh, bin centers, again, um, can be found using that clever method, which I have demonstrated. Okay. And the bin width will be nothing but the difference between subsequent elements. Since lint space does equal. Uh, uh, distribution equal equal it, it equally chops the array right so just uh, getting uh, the difference between two elements two subsequent elements will do to get the bin width okay so we uh, show you the these things so uh, so the lowest and the highest mass uh, in your uh, sample is this okay and the bin array is uh, this and the bin centers are these, and the bin width is 0.46. So it's within the limit. I have asked you, you can choose you know, any number of bins, but just that, make sure it's between 0.3 and 0.5. So the satisfaction. So once you do this, what you need to do, now you create a one-dimensional histogram for all the galaxies in your sample, right? So you can just do it by np.histogram. Bins, you supply with this bin array, right? So if you just give this, uh, 
so far it's been array which will act as bin edges and this bins this np.histogram, histogram they will it will define the bin based on this right and you can save the counts so for all the galaxies i'm just naming it all counts we can do it similarly for a subset right you can apply a condition of early type galaxies we have defined it in previous cells you apply it into this column and then similarly get the etg counts similarly for the late type galaxies you get the etg count so uh, notice that i have like kept the bins the same so i can compare right so if i just um uh, print these then it will just tell us the number of uh, galaxies uh, in um, each bins for all the galaxies and then for early type galaxies and then for late type galaxies let's uh, right. we can i think with i'll split it here just because otherwise this code is going long and it's difficult to explain so I'll just do it let's run this here. okay so this quantifies all the uh, all kinds of galaxies in the bins that we have defined uh, this quantifies the early type galaxies in each bin in the bins that we have defined and similarly for the late types okay and so the fraction can be just you can just obtain by dividing early type array by all array right and similarly for uh, late type galaxies you can do the same thing so once you have got it what we need to plot we need to plot um uh, the counts uh, sorry the fractions as function of bin centers so here i have done i have chosen this error bar because it will uh, also allow me to uh, show the uh, width of the bin right so x error is that bin width by 2 so this shows and let's see what it happens if we just do it <coughs> it just gives you uh, the trend of early and late type galaxies fraction as function of story mass okay so that's how we do it now you can repeat the similar exercise here we have done it using early and late type galaxies right the same thing can be done using the uh, galaxies defined in uh, plane of star formation uh, versus stellar mass so uh, you can define the star, star forming galaxies uh, passive galaxies and green valley galaxies right and then similarly you can um, get their counts you can get their fraction and you can plot them so this has been shown here so it's the same same thing it's just that variable names and the arrays have changed now but uh, it's the same thing that we have done so you can see so the blue denotes the uh, fraction of star forming galaxies uh, red denotes the uh, fraction of passive galaxies and the uh, green denotes the uh, the green galaxies so this, this shows the trend which you, you were asked to do okay now what uh, next question says that now pick only star forming galaxies and in the star forming galaxies you need to show uh, what is the fraction of galaxies which are late type and how is their trend with uh, if you plot as a function of stellar mass so again it's very simple we can find it it's in uh, in, a, in a, a very similar way but what we just need to do we just need to pick only star forming galaxies which we will do using this uh, np dot where condition which we had defined before once you have done that there is again no difference between previous plot and this right you uh, you can obtain the fraction of late types by just you know dividing the length of uh, 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 the arrays which are star forming and uh, are late type divided by the total number of star forming galaxies right so this will give you the fraction and similarly as it's shown here you can plot the uh, uh, you can create the plot as as before so if you just run it, it comes like this so in question you have been only asked to plot the fraction of late types but since early and late types are complementary so if you divide if you just subtract one from another it will give you the another fraction so i just plotted it just for the sake of showing you right so this has been done for the star forming galaxies but you can similarly do for the passive galaxies uh, what you just need to do instead of now uh, sfg you need to replace it by psg 
So if you do it, you will get some answer and that's it. So I'm not going to demonstrate it here, but I'll make this notebook available. You can play with it. But yeah, you will get another fraction. So I think this completes the second question as well. So if there are any um, doubts from your side, please ask now. So should I proceed then? Uh, Prakash Yogesh, uh, I cannot see the chat. Yeah, no, no, just looking at the chat. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, no, I'm just going through. Uh, some, some other people have explained some of the questions. So I'm just looking okay. for unexplained questions. Uh, so I, I looked at this uh, and versus uh, A and D and. So mm -hmm. in Python, there is the and symbol does a bitwise uh, and operation. And uh, the and uh, keyword does a logical and. So yeah. in this particular case, in this usage, it doesn't matter whether you use ampersand or, or A and D. It's just... Yeah. Basically, if you do a bitwise and, then zero and zero is zero, and uh, zero and one is uh, is uh, is zero, and so on. And same thing for uh, if it evaluates to true or false, then the logical and operator will do something like true and true is true, but true and false is false, and so on. So. In this case, it doesn't matter. You you can use whatever. Yeah, but since like I'll I'll, I'll uh, yeah that's okay. But usually when you're defining subsets and all, uh, so this is now very actually simple. But uh, you may have to play with very complex uh, selection. So I'll encourage you to use the uh, not the bitwise but the other one. Uh, because it helps you to write things properly and etc. Yeah, it is in terms of clarity. I think using A and D yeah. will be better. Yeah. So yeah, that's it. Okay, so I'll proceed then. If there are no questions, I guess. Okay, let's move to the next one. So this question is. Okay, so only my comment about this question is that only the data set is different. If you kind of even blindly follow what has been shown to you in lecture 10, you will be able to do it. Uh, the only thing is that now the values are different and there is one emission and one absorption line instead of two emission lines which were shown in the uh, lecture 10, right? So we'll just follow it, okay? So the first step is to you import the models from astrophy.modeling, okay? And you have been given this spectrum as a, as a table, okay? So uh, first you read the columns, the wavelength and the flux. Okay. Uh, when you have done that, you just need to create your model. So here uh, uh, we choose two Gaussians plus a second degree polynomial as our models, right? Because there are two Gaussians, one positive, one negative, and some falling function, which can be approximated by, or can be created using second order polynomial function, right? You also need to supply this model uh, for some guess values. So for, suppose you want to, you know, you know, supply guess value for this. Definitely the amplitude is negative. It's somewhere around, you know, about one. So I've given it a, a amplitude of minus one. Um, the position of wavelength, which is denoted by mean is 20 because it's near 20, right? And then I have given a standard deviation, which is, 0 0.05. Of course, um, this amplitude and the standard deviation, they can be of by factor of two or three. It doesn't matter. Your, your fitter will uh, fit it and minimize it and give you a proper solution. But again, giving a good guess is always good because then uh, things uh, become slightly faster. And not in this case because it's a very small example, but in complicated stuff, yes. Okay, so once you have also given this uh, mean value as 20 for the second one, you know that the other another one is just shifted by uh, uh, nine units on x-axis. 
So there I give min 11. And since the it's it's amplitude and the spread looks twice as this, so I just have given it amplitude uh, two and the standard deviation one, which is twice as this. Okay. So when you create this model, you can display what are your free parameters are. So if you just run it, so these are the free parameters which you will be fitting. Okay. So now one piece of extra information that we need to incorporate is that two lines are separated by nine units. Right. So we encode this into uh, we encode this constraint in our like model like this. So if we first define a uh, uh, function and we supply the model and we just say that the uh, the difference between mean one and mean zero of the two lines is nine units. Okay. So and this just like creates that and then you just need to tie these conditions right so you just say that uh, model mean zero is tied with this constraint that it should be uh, separated by nine units once we have done that as shown in the class you just uh, import a fitter uh, you can use whatever you want but this uh, 11 bar mark or uh, least square fit is one of the things that we're using it has been shown there so i'll be using it here i define this fitter uh, here and then supply it our model and then the x and the y arrays. Once we have done that, and if we just run this code, it will create the best fit model parameters and values. And then that can be uh, shown using this uh, line. So I'm just creating a dictionary which will just map the uh, best fit parameter names to their, um, uh, you know, their, their best fit values, which we get. So let's see what we get. Okay, so for the first line, which is this emission line, uh, we have got the amplitude, which is like 1.37. Uh, the mean zero is 11.2 uh, and the standard deviation is 0.99. Okay. And for the second one, you see that the mean is uh, separated by uh, nine angstroms. And so, uh, and also the amplitude is it's negative and uh, it's 0.75, nearly half of it. And then you have a standard deviation. You also have this C0, C1, and C2, which define your uh, polynomial, right? So this is the value that you get. So this is this is the best fit value of um, uh, that that best fit values of your um, parameters. <clears throat> okay. So now you can display this, and um, you can just create a scatter plot of your uh, flux versus wavelength. And then uh, what you can do is that you can just uh, plot this. Um, model uh, or plot this on, on the same uh, plot and then um, if your model is good of course it will show you that it's following closely which it is doing and if your model is really good then what you need to do first you need to find the residual flux which is like this flux point is the model uh, flux that we have at each wavelength and if the residue is good the mean will be so it will be randomly scattered around uh, value of zero so if you just want to uh, get the mean value and it's one sigma scatter, you can just apply n numpy dot mean to do it and you just get it. So now if you just show it, it, it comes like this. So, so yeah, that's the thing. I think something wrong has np dot mean address. That's okay. It's minus three. That's weird. I think it's taking from the previous one. I don't know. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to this, but yeah, just look at this value. It's uh, scattered around zero and the scatter is point zero eight. I'll come back to this if something was going on. <clears throat> okay, um, so is there a question? Any question there? Sir, in the mean, uh, it it has a factor e to the minus 12 so it is very close to zero oh yeah okay, okay. yeah so thanks thanks for pointing out so pritish i don't see any questions uh, one question has come in the chat okay no not uh, no not related okay 
there is seems to be no question in the chat as of okay. now. So I'll move to the uh, next question, which is like playing with images. So you have been like you you were given a FITS file which contained these three diagonal galaxies. Uh, you were uh, asked to find the centers of the each galaxy um, to get their RNA and get their distances between one another. So this is what we do. So this I have shown you extensively in the. Um, uh, last class, but uh, let's go, go go over it quickly. So in the first line, we just load the image and get their HDU info, right? The header info and where the data is because it's a multi extension file. Um, if you do this, you will find that all data is in uh, the first header. So there we will get this data. And once you uh, obtain the data from this file, uh, uh, this is just an, an, an uh, NumPy array or just an array. So you can just um, find the mean and standard deviation, maxima and minima there. So in this question, uh, you were asked to find with, uh, if this file contains negatives or not. So you see the minimum value is negative, which means that this um, data contains negative. Data. So then we were asked that if there were negatives, so replace them by zero. So we do it using this line. Similar to np, uh, sorry, np dot where we can just define this condition that wherever data is zero, that pixel should be assigned a value zero. So we just do that, and then we'll uh, uh, plot this data uh, using pnt dot show. And um, since the now the uh, minimum is zero, we just need to add some small positive number, and we'll show it. And so it comes like this. All good. Now, uh, you uh, next thing was to find the brightest pixel uh, at the center of the galaxies for each of the galaxies. Okay, so here I'm following a naming convention. The top right galaxy I'm calling one, galaxy one, the central galaxy I'm calling galaxy two, and the uh, bottom left galaxy I'm calling galaxy three. Okay. So the idea to do is that uh, first you need to find a rough region where um, the center of these galaxies they lie, okay. Which you do for the first galaxy you can just do it by here. So you see that it's between two hundred to three hundred uh, pixels along both uh, x and y direction. And um, when you slice this data, you can just ask where this maximum happens, right? Uh, in this slice data, where uh, which is the location. Uh, now where this maximum is happening. So this uh, is encoded in this line. And once you get it, uh, you have your brightest pixel coordinates ready, but now it's choose chop data. So you just need to transform it to back into this, um, you know, uh, the original uh, so-called coordinate frame. So you just add a value to 50, 250 because your origin was of chop data was at 250, 250. Okay, so you get it, the brightest pixel value. Similarly, you do for the galaxy two and galaxy three and obtain their centers. So if you just do it, this will give you the uh, coordinates of uh, the pixel coordinates of um, all these three galaxies. <clears throat> right. Now, uh, as a, in, in second question, um, you have been asked that convert these values now into the sky coordinates that is our index. And in order to do that, uh, we'll use this astrocoid.wcs, right? We import this function wcs. So what it does, it uh, uh, if you supply the header, it will just read the conversion between pixel to sky and you just save it. So once you have that, then you can use this function w dot pixel to world, supply the pixel coordinates, then it will give you the RID for each of them. Okay. So if we just do it, we get the RA deck for all the three galaxies. So this first one is for the uh, galaxy number one. This uh, second one is for central galaxy, and the third one is the uh, galaxy number three, which is uh, bottom left. <coughs> right now, uh, in the uh, next question, you have been asked that you find the distance between these two galaxies from one another. Of course, you can simply do do this by uh, finding separations in pixel scale 
and then multiplying it by uh, 0.167 by 0.167 because given that it's a pixel scale one uh, pixel is uh, uh, about like 0.167 hour second for this particular data okay so then it becomes very easy uh, using this uh, planar kind of geometry you can find the distance between two points which will give you the distance in pixel units you multiply them with this conversion factor and you just will get the the distance from one another okay but this will be okay for like very small distances but um, usually what the case is uh, in reality the sky is not flat right so the geometry is actually spherical or 3d okay so in order to uh, uh, like account for that effect if you use sky dot separation function then it will be the best okay so what it does it just uh, computes the separation between two um, points just apply it some array and depth and it will tell you what's the uh, separation uh, between these two uh, so i am just computing in r second so if you just say c2 underscore sky separation c1 sky what will uh, an arc second what it will do it will give you in arc second uh, the separation between coordinates C2 and C1. Okay, similar between C2 and uh, C3, you can get, and uh, C1 and um, C3, you can get. And I'm assigning some name. So D21 will just mean that this is a distance between the second and first galaxy. D23 will be distance between second and third galaxy, and so on. Okay. And uh, in case, uh, if you just want to compare, how does it compare with, uh, if you use a planar geometry, the same thing can be done here uh, using you know, uh, just plane geometry stuff that pretty standard. Okay, so we just see this, what it does. So in the first line, you have the distances in arc second using this um, uh, sky dot separation. And in the second one, you have, if you just use a planar geometry. Okay, so notice the difference is very small because again, uh, this is a relatively very small patch of area. So this can be approximated as some flat kind of sky, right? Now, how do we know whether like whatever we have done is correct or not? So for that, I am like showing you this into this DS9. So DS9 has this functionality called ruler. And using that, it will tell you what is the difference between, sorry, what is the distance between uh, two points in um, angular units, right? So here you see the distance between second and the third one is about somewhere around 18 arc seconds. So this is what we have got. Similarly, you can try to find what is the distance between uh, the second and the first galaxy. Uh, I can just stretch it and you see there's something about 24 so we have got 24 right and what is the difference between this galaxy and this galaxy you can just stretch it and find somewhere around 42 which we have got right so we have done correct thing okay so now uh, the next part is once you have got this angular distances you just uh, convert them into physical distances and I have asked you to do it in kiloparsec right so for that you need some kind of scale for example we want to know what one arc minute corresponds to in kiloparsec at certain redshift z right so this can be done using this function called cosmo.kpc underscore proper underscore proper per uh, arc minute so what it does you just supply it uh, first, to import some uh, uh, cosmology. So I'm using, for example, WMAP9. You can use Planck 15, Planck 13, whatever. There are a bunch of cosmologies presents, uh, present in this module if you just go and visit. Uh, uh, so you need to supply it a uh, redshift value. So in this question, I have told you all these galaxies are at redshift of 0 0.01. So if you just plug this value of 0 0.01 and run it, it just tells you that at this redshift, one arc minute corresponds to 12.428827 kiloparsec. Right? So now using this, you can easily convert the angular distances into physical units. Right? So D21, which is in arc second, 
is first converted into arc minutes uh, by dividing it by 1 by 60. Okay. And then you can just multiply this factor and so it will tell you what is the physical distance between uh, galaxy 2 and galaxy 1. And similarly for the galaxies. So if you just run it, so these are the distances um, for these galaxies from one another in kiloparsecs. So this is done. <coughs> So that's it here. Okay. Uh, is, is there any question on this um, related to this uh, problem? There are none on the chat. Okay. All right. So I'll just move on. Uh, so question five was actually like totally done in the previous class so i'll just repeat it um and like you had seen in previous class it takes some time to compile and give you the output so what i have done is that i have just saved the outputs and i'll show you but i'm not going to run it but if you uh, convert this cell into a code cell and run it you will get the same output okay so here you were asked to make a RGB image of this galaxy M51. So you were given um, three uh, image files in red, green, and blue channel. So first we load all these things and read their um, uh, information and obtain their data. So we do that here. And then what I do is that uh, for each channel, I get the data and I divide by uh, uh, the mean value. This was done to, you know, create some kind of uniformity between um, each of these data sets because it might happen that one of the data sets has like very large count values. So if you just simply make RGB using default uh, parameters, um, it uh, the image might get dominated by, you know, that dominant channel. So suppose if the green is dominating, then everything will be green. At least most of the things look like greenish. Okay. So uh, we just import make Lupton RGB module from the Astropoid visualization. We supply this RGB values and you can just save it. And if you just run this code and show it, then just create this image, which is shown here. Okay, so that's it. This question is done then. So I think uh, one of you have also like i think had sent me your solutions and uh, one of the problem was that your code was not running because the uh, either the galaxy size was very large or something was wrong in the code so what i have done i, I have like ran your code um, and it took some time but it ran so your code is fine and but what you had done is that um, um, so you did not normalize. So what, what the galaxy looks like is that this RGB comes uh, blue, but your code is running. I think Rita Prata, you are there. Yes, sir. I actually uh, followed your suggestion of slicing the image and doing it. It worked. Okay. All right. I have the image here also. But uh, sir, actually I was asking that uh, whether such large file handling will be there in the a uh, test online test that is supposed to happen because if that happens then uh, maybe my computer can't handle it because i saw that my computer has a ram of uh, 4 gb yeah, maybe yogesh you should take that question yeah yes so uh, the, so the simple answer is no we are not going to make you uh, do anything complicated in the exam the exam will be very straightforward and certainly it will not involve downloading and running data and so on Thank you. So that's from my side. Is there a question that someone would like to ask if something was not clear? There's one question here which uh, came to me as a direct message which I've answered. Hmm. But, uh, maybe for the benefit of others, uh, Preetish can answer. Uh, so the question is uh, relating to that uh, spectrum fitting uh, question. So in spectral fitting, looking at the residual, suppose I want to add another component, say one more Gaussian, so as to improve the best fit statistics. Can we add a component to an already defined model or we will have to redefine the model? 
Sorry, I did not get. Question is, in order to improve the fit, suppose you want to add another model. So hmm. you have modeled it as a polynomial plus two Gaussians. Right. So let's say you want to have three Gaussians. Okay. Right. To try and improve the fit. Hmm. So can we add a component to an already defined model? Or do we have to re uh, redefine the model from scratch? No. So if your model instance is uh, defined, it creates some kind of model object, right? So you can just add. So if you just see, this is a multi-component model already. Yes. So if suppose this was not present, you, you, you are just then making this model as these two and then just adding one extra model. And yeah. So that can be done. So what you could do, for example, you could write after this model is equal to model plus models dot Gaussian 1D is with some other amplitude. Yeah, so you can just, this is allowed. So if you just do it, okay. let's just do it. Okay, it's not my favorite way of doing, but. Yeah, no, what you can do is you can remove uh, one of the models, remove one of the Gaussians. Yeah, okay, no. In the next okay, one. so I was just doing this. Um, yeah. To, right, and so now your model can be model yeah. one plus model two. So this, this will also do, no problem. You can just run it again if you want. There's some invalid syntax is here, 915, there is that. Okay. Yeah, so this has run, right? So now model is model one plus model two. It'll just go on in the same way. So yeah. This is the same. So this can be quite useful interactively where you, you, you go with two components and then you say, no, no, I think a third component is needed. Yeah. You can always add it in. And refit. Remember, you have to run the fit fitter again. Yes. <laughs> the model doesn't change the fit. So this model fit is equal to fitter has to be run again. So what I recommend is since we are sharing these notebooks with you, just, just practice with the notebooks. Change things. Uh, try dif different models. Try different parameters for the make Lupton RGB. Just, just try it because unless you try it and make changes yourself, uh, you will not become proficient. Um, so there is one comment which is pretty lengthy and difficult, but extremely educative for AstroPy beginners. I think that was the aim anyway, when we designed this assignment to get you started in AstroPy. And sometimes when, when you get some, some things right, then you feel motivated to try harder things. Yeah. Yeah. And some people are saying that they had problems, but they will be able to practice uh, with the notebooks uh, shared by us. Uh, so that will be good. Uh, okay. One general comment uh, is that whenever you write real code, this is just a very quick uh, thing. Please use good variable names. That is important. Okay. Using F for flux is okay if you have a five line code. But if you have a hundred line code, you will forget what is F and what is W for variant and so on. So better to have explicit names, put down flux, put down if it's a flux at a certain band, G band flux or something like that. Please do flux underscore G or flux underscore R and so on. Yeah. Uh, try to give meaningful names. It doesn't matter too much because these code snippets are very short. But uh, in longer codes, please stick to that practice. <laughs>